Hello. Welcome to the fifth annual Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Master's Synthesis Competition. GSAS Compass, the Office of Graduate Career Development, is excited to host this year's competition. My name is Francesca Finelli, Associate Director of Graduate Career Development. Good afternoon. And I am Rachel Bernard, Director of Graduate Career Development. It is my pleasure to introduce Carlos Alonso, Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Vice President for Graduate Education, and Morris A. and Alma Shapiro, Professor in the Humanities. Dean Alonso will be providing the opening remarks. Good afternoon, and welcome to the friends, family, peers, alumni, staff, faculty, and others who have come to celebrate our outstanding master's students. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth GSAS master's synthesis competition. When we first held this event in 2016, it quickly became one of my favorite annual events because it embodies the graduate school's central aim to provide our students with opportunities that will allow them to thrive academically professionally and personally, both during their sojourn with us and afterward. This competition not only celebrates the outstanding work of our MA students, it also helps our master's students to hone their presentations, presentation and persuasion skills, which will serve them in any profession. It really pained us when we were forced to cancel the event last year and we are so very pleased to continue the tradition this year. This afternoon, we will hear presentations from 12 of our talented master students whose thesis research ranges from dolphins in the East River to ancient Roman mosaics, community fridges in California, to a love affair between a Japanese noblewoman and an Ethiopian prince in the 1930s. These 12 finalists were selected from an impressive and competitive pool of applicants from across the graduate school. And they have worked hard to distill their thesis re research into a three minute presentation and a single slide. We're also very appreciative of our faculty and MA program staff who support and encourage their students to pursue this ambitious research and take part in this program. I would like to welcome and introduce our judges. Sarah Cross, lecturer in the discipline of ecology, evolution, and environmental biology, and director of the MA program in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. Tishaka Desai, senior advisor for global affairs to the president of Columbia University, senior research scholar for the School of International and Public Affairs, and chair of the Committee on Global Thought. And Brian, Lark Brian Boyd, lecturer and director of the Museum Anthropology MA program. And Ivana Ditsar, winner of the 2019 competition with the project, He Loves Me Not, The Art of Tanya Ostojic and Daniela Ortiz from EU Migration to Anti-Celebration and a graduate of the Modern and Contemporary Art Program. Thank you, judges, for your willingness to participate in this event. The judges will base their score on the content and overall presentation of each finalist. Once the presentations conclude, the scores will be tallied and the winners will be announced. To the 12 finalists, you ex exemplify the range and depth of MA student research at Columbia, at Columbia, and your work is an inspiration to all of us. We're so very proud of what you and your peers have accomplished. The best of luck to you. Thank you, Dean Alonso. And now we begin the competition. Each finalist will present their thesis, an original piece of research, the length of a short book in just three minutes and in a single slide. Rachel and I will introduce each of our finalists. We will begin timing once the presenter starts talking. If they continue their presentation past three minutes, we will mute their microphone. Finalists will be judged on the content of their presentation, their delivery, and the quality of their slide. 
After all of our finalists have presented, we will have a brief stretch break while our judges submit their scores. Additionally, those in the audience will be able to vote on their favorite presenter for the Audience Choice Award. After the votes are tallied, the winners will be announced and we will have a short celebration to applaud the work of all of our finalists. Finally, in the chat, click the link provided to view a digital booklet featuring our finalists, their thesis abstract, and a short bio for each of our judges. Without further delay, I will introduce our first finalist. Reagan Murray from European History, Politics, and Society, presenting Separating the Separatists, Fractionalism in the British Women's Liberation Movement. The British Liber Women's Liberation Movement, or WLM, comprised the fraught marriage of three factions of second wave feminists, socialist, radical, and revolutionary. In 1970, a shared frustration over women's second class status under traditional gender roles and within the burgeoning youth movement had brought British feminists together under the WLM umbrella. From there, the movement took the course of many marriages, dividing over disagreements before ending in divorce. In 1978, after a bitter debate over the WLM's core values went unresolved, British feminists decided to suspend national conferences indefinitely. This thesis asked the question, why did factions emerge within British second wave feminism? To answer it, this project probes factionalism at its most granular, centering on the rifts that cleaved one West Yorkshire group into opposing radical and revolutionary factions. Based on the books and newsletters these feminists wrote, as well as interviews with them, this thesis argues that feminist factionalism owed to ideological differences. The factions disagreed over the relative importance of sexual versus economic oppression, why the patriarchy existed and endured, and the role sexuality should play in women's liberation. Prior explanations of feminist factionalism have diminished the role of ideas. They saw factions as the product of differing strategic preferences without recognizing that ideology undergirds these preferences. Or they saw factions as the outgrowth of personal relationships, overlooking how factionalism arose from breaking down these social ties. Why does it matter that British second wave feminists divided over ideology? First, it illuminates them as key interrogators, alongside well-known male contemporaries like Michel Foucault, of the relationship between social conditioning, gender identity, and sexual power. Second, the variety displayed across the factions differing theories provides us hope as we confront recent femicides from London to Atlanta and beyond. In this variety, we see the potential for adaptability, the potential to develop new solutions to the longstanding problems of sexism, misogyny, and male violence. Thank you. Thank you, Reagan. Now I'd like to introduce Yuki Nishimura from Human Rights Studies, presenting Japanese Latin Americans and the Politics of Redress. In 1988, a historic reparation bill was passed called the Civil Liberties Act. It gave reparations to Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. Yet within the eligibility criteria, it stated that this was only for those who were US citizens or permanent legal residents at the time of incarceration. This effectively left out a group of victims called the Japanese Latin Americans. You see, during World War II, the U.S. went beyond its national borders, took 2,264 Japanese Latin Americans from their homes, brought them to the U.S., and incarcerated them. They deemed them illegal aliens, and many were used in hostage negotiation exchanges. My thesis asks, 
Why were the Japanese Latin Americans excluded from the Civil Liberties Act? In fact, what does reparations and redress have to do with citizenship? I interviewed over 20 Japanese American redress activists. And what I found through my study was that initially the campaign had been foundationed on the language of human rights and had included the Japanese Latin Americans in their calls for redress. Yet as the campaign progressed into the 1980s, there was a bitter trade war between the US and Japan, rising anti-Asian sentiment, and that pressured the redress leaders to change their advocacy language into civil rights, and citizens' rights, to say, we were Americans and this happened to us. We are not the Japanese. This is about violations of citizens' rights. When I asked the Japanese American redress leaders, was there no space to continue with the language of human rights? They told me, human rights, you need a heart. They had deemed that 1980s white America did not have the heart to listen to the Japanese Americans unless they had framed it in the language of civil rights and citizens' rights. Human rights would have rendered the Japanese Latin Americans visible, heard, redressable, yet without it, it was just the Japanese American redress. When we look to future reparations, like HR 40, which just passed through committee, reparations for slavery, we need to look at the language that we are using. As Jill Stoffer in Ethical Loneliness states, repair is not a neutral process. We are making choices about who gets heard and who doesn't. In conclusion, the Japanese Latin Americans have been fighting for their redress for over 76 years, and there are still many others who are still fighting. I ask, do we now have the heart to listen? Thank you. Thank you, Yuki. Now I'd like to introduce Lucia Munez Suero from Global Thought, presenting Traditional Seeds, Modern Seeds, the Global Seed Biocultural Diversity, Loss, and the Case of Informal Seed Savers in Rural Spain. During the last century, more than 75% of crop diversity was lost. Did you know it? Most of this diversity erosion occurred in only three decades, as the consequence brought by the first and second green revolutions that replaced traditional techniques by industrialized systems, small-scale polycultures by large-scale monocultures, and traditional seeds by genetically modified seeds. Although the stated goal was to end hunger, these changes implied a shift from diversity to biological and cultural homogeneity. And this is risky because it reduces our collective ability to confront future environmental challenges. This situation led to a rise of a global movement for seed conservation. Probably what comes to your mind right now are seed banks, right? And that is because most of the attention has been directed towards formal and structured institutions. But Based on my ethnographic fieldwork and complementary studies, I argue that informal, traditional, local, and decentralized networks are equally important and necessary because they maintain the seeds and the associated knowledge alive. Here in the slide, I introduce you to Manolo Andaria, who together with other retired people in a little village of Northwestern Spain are dedicated to saving and exchanging seeds and they have become key agents of the conservation. On the right, you can see a recycled jar and a newsprint envelope where they keep the seeds. As you can see, they have handmade descriptions with the names of the people who gave them the seeds. In addition, in my ethnographic fieldwork, I realized that a common practice among the villagers is that they plant many more seeds than what they actually want to transplant to their own gardens so that they can give the leftovers to their neighbors. So for example, Manolo and Daria will receive seeds and they will give away other things such as homemade tomato sauce. In a circular process of gift exchange, thanks to which the seeds and the associated knowledge are kept alive. This kind of traditional, informal and relational networks exist all over the world. And although they have not received the attention they deserve, they are an essential part of the global effort and the global fight for the conservation of diversity that is today more important than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. 
Now I would like to introduce Maya Rodriguez from Sociology, presenting In Solidarity on the Block and on the Gram, a comparative study of mutual aid assistance and implications for contemporary social movement organizations post-COVID-19. If you were using Instagram last year, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, chances are you saw an infographic like one of the two on the screen. These are posts from two community fridge mutual aid organizations, one in Chicago and one in Los Angeles, and they explain the core of what mutual aid work does. It's a radical practice that asserts that everybody has something to give and we should do so in the spirit of solidarity with one another, not charity. I, for this project, wanted to compare mutual aid in the past and present to see their similarities and differences. In some ways it seemed like it arrived spontaneously on the internet, but I knew that in the 1960s and 70s, Organizations like the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords were critical in establishing what mutual aid could do. So through interviews of fridge organizers and volunteers and content analysis of these fridges Instagram pages, core similarities exist between the time, two time periods. Uh, the mission of mutual aid is similar as well as the population that these groups are trying to serve. Challenges of inequality still persist for these vulnerable populations and the vehicle also is the same. Uh, community fridge is in some ways extremely similar to the free breakfast programs, free food programs that the Black Panthers and Young Lords participated in. Of course, key differences do exist. COVID-19 was an extremely important motivator for mobilization of these groups. The people participating today are extremely diverse and many people have different initial understandings of what mutual aid work is. Technology also plays a critical role as we see with Instagram. The most important difference I've seen though is the means to the end. So in the past, there was an extremely specific political education that was tied to the survival or mutual aid programs of the past. Yes, it definitely changed the way that people's conditions were improved, but there was a specific goal for liberation of marginalized people. Today, that political education informs the way that people are participating and want to participate. But right now in the wake of COVID-19, the most important thing is to get direct aid to the people who need it. The resources that would better the condition right now as we see that there are gaps in formalized systems of care. And on Instagram, we see that it's an important vehicle to educate people especially. These infographics explain to people what this work is and encourages them to volunteer and get involved. It also asks to donate and share. Um, these organizers today don't believe that it's the most radical revolutionary tool to get people involved, but it is serving a meet to the end. And without it, there would not be a wider acceptance for mutual aid in the pandemic today. I hope that in the end that this project establishes that mutual aid is just a legitimate practice today as it was then. It is not going away for social movements and that for the future, it will definitely shape the way that we'll participate in political action. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Nikki Validas from Classical Studies presenting Beware of Envy a reconstructive study of the mosaics of the Roman villa of Scala. Imagine, if you will, that you've traveled back in time to the island of Kefalonia in Greece around the year 200 CE. In front of you is a villa, newly built and stunningly beautiful. You move forward and just inside, amongst the luxury that is immediately apparent, you see a mosaic. You are beckoned forward until you are met with a terrifying image and feel a reaction so visceral and overwhelming you feel as if the images on the floor are coming right at you. So overwhelming and lifelike that you can't help but stumble backwards and attempt to escape. This is just a snippet of what I believe ancient viewers experience when entering the Villa of Scala and the concept around which I have framed my research. In my thesis, I explore the idea that the mosaics in this villa represent a category of art where the singular goal is the conveying of a specific message. Both the composition and the physical environment of the mosaic are considered to create an immersive experience that elicits the highest possible emotional reaction from the viewer. I reconstruct the villa around the mosaics from the ground up to give modern viewers a peek into the ancient experience. This research covers floor mosaics from the Villa of Scala that date to the second or third century CE. This pavement specifically called the Envy Mosaic and shown on the screen shows the personification of Envy being attacked by four wild cats and would have served an apotropaic function. My method revolves around the concept I call mosaics as people movers. For these kinds of mosaics, there is a specific goal in mind. For the envy mosaic, it is the message and warning 
that viewers not envy the owners of the villa lest they risk the same punishment shown happening to the personification of envy. This goal is achieved by the manipulation of the physical space. Here, a viewer's attention is immediately funneled to the center of the hallway by the light pink and white plain exterior borders and held captive by the geometric designs before being led forward by the 3D cubes that point towards the central image. The image itself is set back several feet from the entryway of the villa and require that a viewer follow the path set by the geometric designs and immerse themselves fully in the villa. By the time they arrive at the central image and realize what it shows, they are essentially trapped. And this is exactly what the owner of the villa desired. Their aim was to create an immersive environment that touched every single sense of your possessed and emphasize their message. Do not envy what we have. It is a message that is so clear that even thousands of years later, we can reconstruct it and feel the same emotions ancient individuals felt. The human element of archeological material is so often forgotten in the pursuit of academia. We study these objects, but we forget that they would have served integral purposes to the lives of ancient peoples. And what is more integral than the floor of your house? That is why this research is so important. It provides a peek into the ancient experience and resurrects a message that is so clear, we can still hear the owner saying, beware of envy. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Now I'll be introducing Julia Take from Quantitative Methods in the Social Sciences, presenting Searching for Nearby Drivers, a spatial analysis of Chicago rideshare data. My dad had an old saying from his time living on Dykeman in 1990s New York City, you'll never see a cab go above 125th Street. Now, whether or not this is objectively true 100% of the time, there is a general consensus that you do see less taxis and related services in areas that have lower incomes, less population density, and less attractions. North of 125th Street represented to those drivers at the time who were influenced by racist perceptions of certain neighborhoods as a no-go zone that could potentially be dangerous. Fast forward 30 years later, and a new form of transportation technology has completely overtaken the market, rideshare applications like Lyft and Uber. Uber, Lyft, and other transportation network providers, or TNPs, are reshaping urban mobility with their freelance drivers. They're often lauded for their convenience and lower if not predatory pricing compared to traditional taxi services, but the question remains. Does the gig economy perpetuate the same inequities in service that we see in the traditional economy? Now, Uber and Lyft have been pretty opaque about their pricing strategies, but spatial data can give us a sense of how different neighborhoods are being served. Using uh, census data and data from the city of Chicago, I investigated how different areas were being served by TNPs, controlling for variations in population. Four main findings reveal a lower quality of service for marginalized communities. You'll see higher fares, lower, uh, higher rates of cancellations, lower rates of shared rides and trips taking longer for drop-off locations that have lower levels of income, higher levels of poverty and are less white. As you can see on the graph to your left or on the back rather, the main per, uh, reason for this is because of the structure of the city itself. When you have massive inequity and segregation, then those factors are going to be replicated within services. On your right, you see that the line graph tells us that as median income increases fare, or decreases, fare actually increases up until around the $11 mark, which represents the majority of rides. Now, as long as there's this intense urban segregation and people in marginalized communities are excluded from life in the city center, then transportation will always be more onerous and expensive for these groups. I detail four policy proposals, or three policy proposals rather, in my paper um, for this issue. Um, more public transportation, um, private public cooperation that could incentivize drivers to go into certain areas, as well as tackling poverty and inequity from the source. Also, we can't forget about su uh, supporting drivers during these times because they're so disadvantaged by the system as it is. In conclusion, transportation and access to transportation cannot be optional. It is a human right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Next, I would like to introduce Harpal Singh from Oral History. Harpal will be presenting 1984 Sikh Genocide. Thank you, Dr. Rachel. I have been working on my thesis on the Sikh Genocide of 1984 using the tools of oral history. Early on in the program, I figured that 
people in North America hardly know about this tragic episode. So let me give you a quick snapshot of what happened back in the day. On 31st October 1984, India's Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, was killed by her Sikh bodyguards. This followed her ordering the Indian Army to storm the most sacred shrine of the Sikhs, the Golden Temple in Amritsar, to take out a rustic preacher who had become a renegade. The army operation badly damaged the Golden Temple complex and hurt Sikh religious sentiments across the globe, and they avowed to take revenge. I personally consider Mrs. Gandhi's assassination by her bodyguards as an act of treachery, but what followed was worse. Over the next three days, more than 5,000 Sikhs were killed on the streets of India, more than half of them in the capital city of Delhi in the most barbaric way. 36 years later, the uh, families of the survivors are still struggling to secure justice and have a life of dignity. The questions I've addressed in my thesis are, one, was the violence against the Sikhs a genocide? The finding is yes. I've used the tools of uh, the uh, definition and parameters of uh, United Nations to test my contention. Was the uh, violence against Sikhs organized? The finding is yes. The perpetrators used uh, electoral maps and ammonium nitrate and phosphorus, which was not accessible to an ordinary citizen. Three, was a state complicit? The answer is yes. The new prime minister of India, in fact, endorsed the violence and said, when a big tree falls, the earth does shake a little. He did not agree to an inquiry into the violence until July of 1985. Congress party's uh, leaders and ministers led the mobs everywhere. Four, has justice been served? The finding is no. For more than 5,000 killings, there haven't been even 50 major convictions and the cases are still dragging on in the courts due to institutional apathy. Five, should the world pay attention? The answer is an emphatic yes. If we believe in civilized living, accountability in a democracy and rule of law, and we want to discourage medieval justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harpal. Next, I would like to introduce Viviana Valle from the American Studies Program. Viviana will be presenting Sugar Baby University, Understanding Sex Work Within the University. In the United States, student loan debt ranks as the second largest component to overall debt at a staggering $1.71 trillion. With the consistent increase of tuition, decreased state funding, and the easy availability of student loans to blanket over the large bill, the university has become a huge neoliberal enterprise. Due to this large price tag and recent recession brought on by COVID-19, news outlets have reported a phenomenon of students who have entered the sex work industry seeing a rise of attention to online platforms such as Seeking Arrangements and OnlyFans. This is hardly a new trend as a similar spike was seen in the 2008 recession and it was met with similar media panic. Through an analysis of television, movies, and news about student sex workers, contrasted with the literature review of past scholarship on sex work, I was able to find the gaps in representation of this field of labor and the way it has encouraged the public's extreme responses and villainization of student sex workers. Respected shows, What Would You Do?, places unsuspecting strangers into on-the-spot situations to reveal their perspectives on ethical dilemmas. In one episode, two girls sit at a diner and talk loudly about the need to start, quote-unquote, selling your body in order to pay for overwhelming debt. Customers at the diner express concern over the young girl's safety, others over her future career goals, but one woman differed in opinion by enthusiastically exclaiming, go girl. Behind the scenes, trusted host John Quinones comments between each take of the customer's response, guiding the audience to what the correct ethical reaction should be. He shows praise over the man who lectures the young girls about other options, but then states surprise over the woman who lends tips to safer interactions with clients. 
the judgment from the host and customers towards sex work maintains the idea that the labor is beneath university students. And televising these messages solidifies consensus on the issue throughout the masses. Yet regardless of pushback to the work, the commodification of sexuality continues to thrive. The representation of students engaged in sex work rarely ever sheds light on larger structures that create the material conditions that warrant the need for income outside traditional wage labor. By addressing the issues that affect the student sex worker community, such as the stigma and misrepresentation produced by sensationalized media, we can begin to assess what the actual needs and appropriate resources student sex workers need to stay safe and financially secure. Thank you, Viviana. Our next speaker will be Sarah Tribu from Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology. Sarah's project is environmental drivers of bottlenose dolphin foraging behavior in an urbanized estuary. So if you look at the photo on your top left, this was taken in the waters of New York and New Jersey, which are home to an abundance of marine wildlife, including bottlenose dolphins. Bottlenose dolphins are found in these waters every year from spring to fall. But in recent years, they've been seen both more frequently and for an extended period of time which is super exciting because it suggests that recent efforts to restore the quality of the habitat here have made it more suitable for use by marine mammals. But there's also cause for concern because this is a highly urbanized system. If you look at the map on your top right, this is showing shipping traffic from 2019 alone. And shipping is only one of many ways that humans use these waterways. Not depicted here are recreational fishing activities or coastal developments. And anywhere where there's overlap between use by humans and use by wildlife, there's potential for conflict. So understanding where, how, when, and why bottlenose dolphins are using these waters is important for mitigating that potential conflict. But we still know very little about how dolphins are actually using these areas. So to address this gap in knowledge, I decided to look at a behavior that's critical for survival, foraging. To do this, I teamed up with the folks at Wildlife Conservation Society's Ocean Giants program, and they put down six underwater microphones throughout the waters of New York and New Jersey to record the underwater soundscape. Now dolphins, when they're foraging, produce a very specific sound. So when that sound was picked up by those underwater microphones, we could infer that foraging was occurring. We then compared when foraging occurred to spatial, temporal, and environmental characteristics, including light availability, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll concentration, time of day, time of year, water level, and location. And what we found is that overall, dolphins were foraging in the majority of days in which they were detected, suggesting that this area might serve as an important foraging ground for this migratory population. But there were spatial differences. If you look at the map on your bottom right, you'll see the location of the six underwater microphones. And the two that are highlighted in orange are the two where foraging activity was most prevalent. We also looked at trends in foraging across seasons and found that seasonally, foraging was highest during the summer and fall and was strongly associated with warmer water temperatures and lower concentrations of chlorophyll. Throughout the day, Foraging was highest during the night and early morning hours and was strongly associated with reduced light availability and intermediate water levels. So as the tide flows in and flows out. So this information is important because it provides baseline ecological knowledge for a population that we know very little about, but it can be also used to identify and predict important habitat for the species, which is going to become increasingly important for mitigating conflict as this area is further industrialized and environmental conditions shift due to climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Our next finalist is Federica Costantino from East Asian Languages and Cultures. She'll be presenting A Fateful Alliance, the 1934 betrothal of Koruda Masoko and Araya Adebe. Today we are used to royal marriages, but did you know that there were plans of a royal marriage between the empires of Ethiopia and Japan? Now look at this photo, Japanese to remember shattered romance. Remember, so it was a thing of the past in July 1935 when this article was published. Shattered evokes the idea of something badly broken. Romance, of course, because it involved a wedding. Let's take a look at the protagonists. 
Kuroda Masako, daughter of a Japanese Viscount, Araya Bebe, nephew of the Ethiopian Emperor. But the article also mentions Mussolini, the fastest leader of Italy. And why was that? When one thinks of Japan in the 1930s, fascist Italy, Ethiopia squeezed by colonial powers, the images that come to mind are somehow very distant from romance. Still, in 1934, the engagement between Kuroda and Araya, portrayed as a royal marriage, brought these countries together. The event generated a great deal of reactions from Japan to Australia to Europe. Nevertheless, it has never been analyzed in depth because relegated to the realm of gossip. Then Ethiopia and Japan were the only two non-white empires. They had escaped the yoke of white colonization. They had also defeated two Western powers, Italy and Russia. This was particularly significant for Pan-Asian and Pan-African communities, which regarded the marriage as a non-white alliance against whites. In Europe, however, as you can imagine, this popular enthusiasm was not so shared. Many European countries had economic interests in Ethiopia and did not want Japanese competition. Italy also had colonialist goals in Ethiopia and did not want Japan to get a royal foothold in the African country. In the end, the engagement never became a marriage. Precisely because of this, I argue that this failed engagement initiated a significant turning point for Japanese history because it led Japan closer to Italy. Usually, historians see the 1935 Italo-Ethiopian War as the start of Japanese-Italian intimacy. Only the year before, this was difficult to imagine. Italy and Japan were quite at odds for this marriage. A war was not excluded. I argue that instead, it's this episode, the moment in which Japan faithfully decided to shift its alliances. Japan eventually did not want the marriage to, preferring Italy. In fact, the Japanese imperial household never gave Kuroda the necessary license for a Japanese aristocrat to get married. After all, the marriage was more wanted by African-American communities. However, if anything, it was their imagined romance with Japan that had been shattered. Japan, in fact, had already abandoned the colored Ethiopia the altar by the time it was occupied by Italy. The most classic elopement story happened. In the end, Japan decided to tie the axis knot with white Italy. Thank you. Thank you, Federica. <clears throat> Next, we have Jennifer Kaplan from English and Comparative Literature. Jennifer will be presenting, I'm Talking Here, a metalinguistic study of young people's attitudes toward and use of New York City English in 2016 through 2020. If I asked you to imitate a New York City accent, what would you say? You might ask me where you can find some coffee or tell me to forget about it. What you might not realize is that one of the most distinctive features of New York City English is where New Yorkers' tongues are when they pronounce their vowels. Historically, American English has three back vowels. O as in goat, oo as in goose, and aw as in caught. However, in a trend that began in the South during the Civil War, Americans started pronouncing these vowels with their tongues more forward in their mouths. Well, most other dialect regions of the U.S. started doing something similar about 50 years ago, starting in California. If you've ever heard a stereotypical valley girl say that she's tan like cow, that's an extreme example of what linguists call back vowel fronting, or BVS. What makes New Yorkers' speech unique is that they don't front these vowels. That is, until very recently, when data collected for the corpus of New York City English found that some young lifelong New Yorkers are fronting their back vowels. But this begs the question, why are some young New Yorkers speaking with BVF and others retain the back vowels with their parents' generations? It turns out that in an appropriately New York fashion, it's all about attitude. Using transcripts collected as part of the corpus of New York City English, I compared 10 young New Yorkers who front their back vowels with 10 who don't. All participants answered questions about their attitudes toward New York City English and accents, and New Yorkers more generally. What are New Yorkers like? Who sounds like a New Yorker? Do you sound like a New Yorker? I scored participants from one to five in two categories. One, how closely an individual identifies with a New York accent, and two, how positively they evaluate New York and New Yorkers. I found that not only are New Yorkers pretty good at evaluating whether or not they sound like New Yorkers, but that the degree to which they do or don't front their vowels correlates with their orientation toward or away from the city. In other words, young New Yorkers who keep their back vowels back are more likely to express their local identities in other ways, 
including intimate knowledge of neighborhoods, using New York City specific slang, or their admiration of famous New Yorkers like Biggie Smalls or Lil' Kim. By comparison, fronters more often focus on life outside of New York, with some admitting to intentionally mimicking the way non-New Yorkers talk. But why does this matter? Accents don't just happen to us. We aren't just the passive products of our environment. Our relationship with and attitude toward where we live shapes us, including the way we talk. Understanding why characteristic features of New York City speech have remained in use by young people, even as American speech elsewhere homogenizes, reveals something special about not just New York City accents, but New Yorkers. Unlike in other major cities across the Northeast, generations of New Yorkers maintain a local pride that's not just on the tip of their tongue, it's all the way back. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And now we have our final presentation from Linda Chang in East Asia Regional Studies. Her project is Gender Dynamics of Protest and Visibility in China, Biased Erasure and Manufactured Passivity. Can you hear what she is crying about? This is Ling sitting on the ruins of her home in China. One day, a local land developer unlawfully tore down her home while she was asleep. When the sun rose, her house was nothing but rubble. She was suddenly homeless with no other choice. She could only sit on the ruins and protest. The sign above her says, the law does not tolerate violent demolitions of residences. Her relatives posted Ling's story on Weibo, a Chinese social media, hoping to draw attention from the media and public. However, Ling's story was never picked up. After finding out about her story, I wanted to know whether Ling's case was an outlier and how it might have differed if this had happened to a man. In my study, I found that Ling is not the only woman who this has happened to. In fact, there were many more women whose stories were similar to Ling's but were not mentioned in the media. I also found that men's protests that were similar were picked up much more by the media than women's protests. This raises the question, how does media shape our conceptions of gender and resistance? To this date, there currently exists no research analyzing this relationship. Using big data from Weibo, I look at over 120,000 protest events and their corresponding media reports from 2010 to 2017. By using textual methods to determine the number of women versus men of each protest, I was able to analyze the relationship between gender participation, media, and protest dynamics. I found that women protest more and more violently than men, but men get reported by media much more than women. And the few times that women are reported, they're portrayed as passive. Ling and most of the other women taking part in protests are doing so for survival. I term this relationship the media gender protest cycle. Oppressive gender structures exclude women from resources for their survival, such as their homes. Therefore, with no better solution, they have to protest, often violently. But the media does not report on these women, and therefore, these women receive no public attention and their needs are not met. And as the media misrepresents women as passive, it legitimizes women's subjugation, which then continues the pattern of women being excluded from resources. And the cycle keeps going. In this key political moment, my research shows how seemingly unrelated things like media, gender, and protest are in fact inseparable. Think about that the next time you see reports of protest in the media. And as media's participation in protest rises globally, what will it take for the media and hence the public to properly acknowledge it? I hope that my research can play a part in bettering media portrayals of women's resistance and the lives of women like Ling around the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Linda. So this concludes our presentations. Congratulations to all of our finalists for a job well done. You impressed us with the quality of your research and your ability to synthesize your work into simply a three minute presentation. We will now collect the judges scores. Audience members, this is your chance to vote for your favorite presentation. Please click the link in the chat to submit your vote for Audience Choice Award. While we wait for the results, feel free to take a five minute stretch break or pour yourself a celebratory drink in anticipation of the announcement of our winners. 
We will now play some music to fill the time. Thank you. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for hanging, uh, hanging in with us there. A couple technical difficulties, but we are back and we are ready to announce our winners. First, we will announce the audience's top pick. The Audience Choice Award goes to Maya Rodriguez from Sociology for her project, Solidarity on the Block and on the Gram, a comparative study of mutual aid assistance and implications for contemporary social movement organizations post COVID-19. Congratulations, Maya. Now we'll announce the judges selection, starting with third place. And third place goes to Linda Chang from East Asia Regional Studies for the project, Gender Dynamics of Protest and Visibility in China, Biased Erasure and Manufactured Passivity. Congratulations, Linda. Uh, next, we have our second place winner. And in second place is Sarah Tribu from Ecology, Evolution and Conservation Biology for the project, Environmental Drivers of Bottlenose Dolphin Foraging Behavior in an Urbanized Estuary. Congratulations, Sarah. And finally, our winner in first place is Lucia Munoz Suero from Global Thought, presenting Traditional Seeds, Modern Seeds, the Global Seed Biocultural Diversity Loss and the Case of Informal Seed Savers in Rural Spain. Congratulations to all of our winners. And now I'd like to ask finalists and judges um, if all of you would now turn your cameras on and audience members, this is your time to offer your congratulations in the chat box and just make sure that you text to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see um, all of your kind words. So now let's all take a moment to celebrate and cheer on all of our presenters and our winners for the 2021 GSAS Master's Synthesis Competition. <laughs> Nice job, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. 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 Amazing. <laughs> Clap track. Congratulations. Thank you so much to all of you for attending our fifth annual GSAS Master's in Thesis competition. We wanna give a special thanks to Afia Wilson, who has been our behind the scenes producer today. Thank you also to Dean Alonso for your opening remarks and to all the GSAS staff who assisted us with organizing and coordinating today's event. And thank you to our audience for supporting our amazing students for all, um, all of the messages that you put in the chat along the way, that was wonderful. And of course, we extend our gratitude to our four judges. Thanks so much. And of course, finally, a huge thank you and congratulations to all of our master's student and recent graduate finalists on your presentations and on graduating from Columbia University. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank well you. done all, well done.